Okay, now I think we have a picture here. Um, please, uh, we have uh, Japen Kopman from the Radboud University Nijmegen here, who is going to talk to us about some very interesting developments with uh, smart cards and uh, attribute-based authentication. Uh, so please give a very warm welcome to Japen Kopman, who is going to reveal to us the Gospel of Irma. Thank you. Yes. So my name is uh, Jaap Koopman. I'm from the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands and also from the Privacy and Identity Lab. And I'm really grateful to the organizers of uh, CCC to uh, allow me to give this presentation about a cool project that we are doing in Nijmegen in the Privacy and Identity Lab. And because of the season, uh, I thought it was, uh, uh, would be good to frame it as a, um, like a Christmas kind of story. The Gospel of Irma. Irma is our cool project, and I will tell you later what it means and what it does. Um, back in the um, pre-internet uh, age, um, when you had to identify yourself, you would have, you know, have a passport or an identity card, and you would um, you know, use that to prove your identity. You would also use that uh, to prove certain attributes, uh, certain properties about yourself, like your nationality, um, your age, or your name. And um, in fact, you would actually have to use that in a physical shop. You actually have to present your uh, ID card, for instance, if you would be slightly younger than me, uh, still look like about maybe 16, 17, and then prove that you were actually over 18 in order to buy some alcohol. So, you know, passports uh, were used a lot. And um, then internet came, and then people thought, OK, we need some information about these people that use the internet. Um, so they basically sort of copied the passport model of doing identification and actually also proving you know, information about yourself to the internet world using um, certificates, X509, whatever. Um, these things you know, contain your name, uh, contain other information if you have extension fields. Uh, and the, the good thing of the passport in the, in the physical world was that you know, even if you would show your passport or your identity card to a, a shopkeeper, um, he would usually not have photographic memory. So you show the passport, he verifies your age, and he forgets about you. In the digital world, the digital merchant never forgets. He just copies the whole certificate. That's a problem. Um, so people thought of uh, like intermediate steps to uh, smoothen the process. Also partly because they didn't want uh, uh, to store all the information that different merchants, they want to sort of like ease the experience for the user. So they thought of uh, something called identity management, where here in this picture you have this user that you know, wants to do some uh, business at a, what they call a relying party in, in these uh, kind of schemes. And in order to actually access that service, he would have identify himself. So what would he have to do? The relying party says, well, you know, I, I have this contract with this identity provider, so if you have an account there, just sign in at the identity provider, and then the identity provider will tell me everything I need to know about you. Again, you know, if, if the relying party wanted to, he could ask all kinds of stuff about yourself, not only your age or your nationality, but could ask also your name and other identifying information. This is really um, not so good. And that is uh, where Irma steps in, our heroine of the story, where the gospel, what the gospel is all about. Um, she is trying to prevent this situation from happening. And Irma is the project that we are, uh, we are developing in, in Nijmegen. Um, and it's, Irma stands for I Reveal My Attributes. And it's a, a collaboration between um, the, my university, and TNO, and Surfnet. Surfnet is a big um, network provider for academic institutions in the Netherlands. Um, and one of the uh, uh, important features of, of our approach is that we use uh, attribute-based credentials. And that allows us to um, you know, only show, only prove to certain uh, relying parties certain specific attributes, certain specific pieces of information about yourself without revealing everything in one go. Secondly, uh, it is smart card based. And this is uh, what set us apart from a lot of other attribute-based credential uh, approaches. Uh, because we are the first that actually um, can implement a full attribute-based credential system on the smart card with reasonable performance. And of course, uh, by, why did we do this? Um, a smart card is a more or less secure container for uh, these kind of credentials. Um, and by using uh, specific protocols, we can also make it privacy-friendly. 
Everything is open source. Actually, all the sources are on, on GitHub. I will give you the, the link later at the end of the talk, so you can uh, look, um, maybe even contribute. That would be really cool. Um, and the, the, the main idea of attribute-based credentials in general, and also in the Irma project, is that we want to make the user in control. We want the user to decide what he shows to a relying party in order to access a service. It's not a relying party that decides, it's the user that decides, and sees, and has control. The infrastructure that we, we envision is, is, in principle, open, but there is, has to be some kind of governance, and I will explain later why that has to be. You have to have something to decide whether certain relying parties can be part of that system, whether certain uh, attribute issuers can be part of that system. Um, and I'll show you how it works. The important bit to remember first is that an attribute-based credential system allows you to prove an attribute about yourself, your age, your nationality, some kind of preference, blood groups, whatever, uh, without revealing your full identity. You, you each, and ed each and every attribute is an individual item that you can individually show and present to somebody else. These attributes are stored in so-called called credentials. That's why everything is called attribute-based credentials. And uh, such a credential is really a secure container for your attributes. This is what sto in Irma is stored on the smart card. One, in a way, attribute of such a credential is the, the, the key. The key that is only stored in the, in the smart card, that never leaves the smart card, and that is used to prove that you own that credential. There's also an uh, exp expiration time. Credentials only have a you know, uh, limited uh, validity. And there are certain attributes. In, in the case of Irma, we only have uh, four attributes per credential. These credentials are issued by a credential issuer. Typically, uh, after showing that you have, uh, uh, you have the right, or you actually uh, have the properties that the credential claims that you have, the credential issuer will issue you that credential. Of course, it's very important that whoever issues the credential has, uh, you know, um, anything meaningful to say about your, you, and is actually trusted to say something about you. And also that many other people trust that issuer to say something about you. It doesn't really help anybody here in this room if uh, my father would say that my name is Jaap en Koopman. You don't know my father, so why would you trust him? Similarly, it wouldn't really help if uh, my son would uh, go to the, the liquor stop and say, you, my father says that I'm 25. The liquor store says, yeah, okay, that's fine, but, you know, uh, I want a, a, a proper authority to say this. Like in a passport, you know, you need, need a, a proper identity card, a proper, proper passport to do that. Same goes here. I already said the credential contains attributes, and these attributes you can selectively disclose. So even though there's always four, at least four slots for attributes in a credential, that does not mean that if you want to use the credential, you have to show all the four attributes at the same time. During the showing protocol, you can decide which attributes to reveal and which not to reveal. And what can you use this for? Um, notice that I'm calling this uh, uh, consistently attribute-based credentials. Um, when these systems were uh, designed, they were at first called anonymous credentials. So the people from IBM who designed this called this anonymous credential systems. But, you know, whether a credential is anonymous or not really depends on the information that's in there. If I put my name as an attribute in a credential, that's highly identifying. If I put a social security number in an attribute in a credential, then this thing is highly identifying, not anonymous at all. That is an important distinction to remember, because what, what we're doing here is to make a system that gives you full privacy in, 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 the, in the infrastructure, but you can totally put identifying information in, in, in attributes and use it that way. So if you, if you look at, for instance, anonymous uses of these things, um, one, one uh, well, simple stuff is like age verification, like the, 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 the typical and almost boring example of the liquor store, uh, where you have to pro prove your age. Um, slightly more interesting, uh, especially because this is uh, something that started many, many years ago, uh, after our OVA chip card hacking stuff and thinking about, okay, how could we improve that system, one of the things that we thought of was actually, okay, maybe we can use attribute-based credentials for like a, 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 a train ticket system. 
And you can, for instance, encode the fact that you have a, a, a track pass, that you're, you have free travel on a certain track, or you have free uh, travel for a month or a year on the Deutsche Bahn or an, anywhere else. Um, another interesting application of attribute-based credentials is, uh, for instance, uh, concert tickets. I don't know how the situation is here in Germany, but at least in the Netherlands, um, there's a huge black market of popular, popular uh, shows. So when, when a show opens, the ticket sale opens, um, many people uh, uh, want to get tickets. But of course, there's also like, companies that try to get a lot of tickets, buy them first, and then try to sell them later for double the price. That, that, that can, you, you can easily do that because you basically get a paper ticket that you can just sell again and again and again. Now, if you would encode a concert ticket as an attribute in a credential, it would be bound to your card. You would not be able to, trans to transfer it to anybody else. So by just using attribute-based credentials for these kind of systems, for, for these kind of applications, you, you, you basically kill the possibility for having a black market. Of course, you have to think about, OK, what do you do if you want to return your ticket or whatever? Huh? You have to have some, some exception processing. But you, you get the point. There's, of course, also pseudonymous uh, uh, applications of, of credentials, for instance, uh, loyalty cards, like if you go to your shop, um, uh, a subscription to a newspaper online. If I want to access my online newspaper, I, I have an account. That ca account can just be pseudonymous. They don't have to know who actually reads that paper. They just want to know that the person has a subscription. And you can even argue whether that should be not totally anonymous, right? And there's full identifying applications like uh, using it for passport-like stuff, like uh, uh, your address, uh, your social security number, or a student card, or even something like emergency health information, where you know, attributes encode your blood type um, and, and very uh, vital uh, medical information. So how does it work? So here have you, uh, it's important to realize that in, 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 in attribute-based credentials, the issuing of a credential is separate from using it. This is also different from the transitional model of identity uh, management that I showed, where all the parties have to be online. You know, if you go to your lying party, the identity provider also has to be online. In the case of attribute-based credentials, this is not the case. You first um, go to a credential issuer and ask to issue, to get issued a credential to your earmark card that you hold as a user. And then later on, you can use it at a relying party. And I already drew the scheme authority there in the corner um, to, to highlight the fact that the scheme authority uh, has certain rules about who can be a credential issuer or who, who cannot be a credential issuer. In the end, the overall trust, the overall uh, trust that users of the system, and users are in this case not only ordinary users, but also relying parties, uh, depend on the trustworthiness of, uh, trustworthiness of individual credential issuers. In that sense, the situation is a bit like what you see in uh, uh, certificates for, for, for websites. If there's one rotten apple, the whole trust you know, falls apart. So that's an issue. And so you know, if, once you have convinced the credential issuer that you actually are a certain person that actually has certain attributes, he will issue you that credential. Now, if you want to use that credential, disclosing some attributes, um, at a relying party, another protocol runs. And in this case, um, the relying party has a so-called uh, uh, relying party certificate that uh, encodes the access rights, the things that the relying party can see. This is important because you can, you can either uh, let the user decide all by himself whether he uh, should reveal certain attributes, but it's even stronger if you by default, restrict the access of the relying party anyway. If a, uh, an online video rental store only needs to verify whether you are a member or whether, and whether you are a certain age, because certain age restrictions apply to certain uh, online material, you just give him only the right to verify those attributes. You don't give him the right to access name, uh, address, uh, whatever. So this is encoded in these relying party certificates. And if um, a user goes to a relying party to access a service, then first the relying party certificate is transferred to the earmark card, together with a request for certain attributes. And the card verifies that the attributes the relying party asks for are actually permitted by the scheme authority. 
And then still the user has the choice to uh, say, OK, I will, I, I will actually reveal these attributes or not. In any case, you see these like, uh, darker boxes in the, in, the, in the credential for the attributes that are not revealed. Important properties for, uh, for these kind of systems are uh, the following. You, of course, credentials should not, be un should not be forgeable, because otherwise the whole system will be useless. Uh, you want to make sure that whenever a credential contains a certain attribute, then this is something that a credential issuer issued, and not a user generated all by himself. Secondly, and this is the, the, the privacy-preserving property, um, it should be uh, unlinkable. And unlinkable means that if you uh, actually, that has two aspects. First of all, it should mean that the, if you get a credential issued from an issuer, the issuer should not be able to detect the use of that credential at an, on, at an arbitrary relying party. So this totally disconnects the issuer from the use of the credentials. He has no way of following you uh, looking at the credentials. In the technical sense, of course, yeah, and again, remember, this is in the technical infrastructure. If the attributes themselves contain an uh, identifying number, of course, he would be able to track that. Secondly, there is also uh, unlinkability between several showings of the same credential to different relying parties or even to the same relying party. If I would go to my online newspaper with my credential showing that I have a subscription there, then that online newspaper would not be able to tell that I was the same person coming there again and again and again. So he would not know how much time I spent on that site, or how, how many times I go to that site. So these are very, very strong privacy guarantees. Third of all, an important property, but a hard property, is uh, revocability. You want to be able to revoke certain credentials. For instance, if they are abused, if they expire, well, this you can do by uh, setting the expiry time of each credential, you know, at the, at the right time. Uh, but sometimes things, ch you know, things change. Uh, if you encode certain access rights, for instance, uh, and, and, and uh, you, you forget to pay for something or, or whatever, you want to revoke that access right if that is encoded in a uh, credential. So you want to be able to revoke credentials. Of course, and, you know, if, if you're paying attention, you realize that if you want to do that in an attribute-based credential system that has these unlinkability guarantees, you should already start wondering how can you do that. Because, you know, I just told you that if you, you know, if, if I present a credential to a, to a relying party and I come back again, he will not be able to tell that this is the same credential. So how do I revoke? This is a challenge. We have some ideas for that, but that's, that's a challenging thing to do. Of course, things should be non-transferable. It should not be possible for somebody else to use my credentials. In a technical sense, this is guaranteed by using this, this key that is embedded in, as one of the attributes in each and every uh, credential, because that binds it to the card. Yet, you know, there is not really that much stopping me from uh, using uh, uh, my card somewhere else. We, did have, we do have certain features to prevent that, but more in the, in the, in the, online, in the offline world sorry, than in the online world. So here you see an Irma card. These are the cards we produce. We replastify them and laminate them uh, and issue them um, at the moment as, as for testing purposes. Um, this is mine. And you see my picture on the front. And you see some, some uh, generic information on the back saying that this is a, 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 member of, uh, is a property of the Irma project. Uh, so if you find it, please return it. And there is a uh, unique number at the bottom. Now, I said that this was a privacy-friendly tool, so why is this unique number there? This unique number is only on the outside of the card. On the side of the card that you typically do not present in a shop, you only show the front. And this is for if you, as a user, want to revoke your card. That's what that number is for. It's not inside the card, it's only on the outside of the card. Inside the card, that's a contactless card. So that means that you can use NFC uh, phones or NFC tablets as, as readers, which is a huge advantage because, I mean, many more and more and more devices start getting them. You see more smartphones, more tablets having that kind of stuff. Inside the cards, we implement, multi, we implement uh, uh, Edemix on a Multos card. We initially started off using a Java card, 
uh, that was in a way slightly simpler to, 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 to program. However, we didn't have the, 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 the full access to the crypto hardware that we really required to do the complex uh, crypto operations that we have to do in order to implement this EDMIC system that originally, I think now 10, 15 years ago, was designed by IBM. Um, and we use 1,024-bit uh, 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 keys, which is a bit low, but otherwise we do not get the, the performance that we want. So this picture on the outside is uh, needed to ensure that you, uh, uh, that you are bound to your credentials, to your card. So in, a, in an offline world, in a, in, a, in a shop kind of world, uh, you can still use this. In the online world, of course, the picture is meaningless. You, the, the relying party doesn't see it. So the only, th the only thing that we can do then is using pin codes or something to prevent somebody who stole your card to use your card. But that still does not prevent you from you know, giving your card to your little brother and then al allowing him to buy liquor. This is some, but this, is, I, I should add, is something that happens in all uh, online systems anyway. I mean, I can always, you know, give my uh, access uh, credentials to somebody else and he can use it. About performance, because this is really the, the, the most interesting, uh, uh, or that was the most challenging thing that we uh, did, and that actually allowed us to do, my, to, to do the whole project in the first place, and that is that we were able to do a full card implementation of uh, Edemix uh, on, I think in this case, an Infineon SLE. This, these figures are probably from the 66. I think we now use the seven, uh, 77. Uh, and you see that issuing still takes, um, depending on the number of attributes that you want to issue, uh, a considerable amount of time. But um, showing some attributes is, uh, depending on the number of attributes you want to show, uh, if you uh, have two attributes stored, and you want to show one attribute, you see that it's almost uh, a second. And if you want to show two attributes, it's uh, 0 0.89 uh, seconds. But if you have five uh, stored attributes and you want to sh disclose uh, five of them, it's uh, 0 0.9 seconds, below a second. This is usable. This is not usable for all kinds of applications. So, for instance, the application that I mentioned that inspired this research in the first place, namely public transport, it's, that's a no-go, because then people would have to wait one second before they could actually go through the, 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 the toll. That doesn't work. But for certain online stuff, it works. And uh, later on in the, in the afternoon, I'm, I'm around to give demos so you can see how the, the performance actually feels. And this is really... Uh, uh, I think we are, are, are uh, we hold, uh, in a way, a world record in this. We are the fastest implementation of this stuff on, on smart cards. But for that, we need to have really good access to the crypto co-processor. And we're actually talking to smart card providers now to actually give us that access, even on other platforms. Because that would really you know, help us get this, this speed uh, uh, even better. I already told you that um, we use NFC, a uh, contactless card, and that means that we have all kinds of terminals that we can use uh, to, uh, as, as, as terminals in the, in the uh, EMR system. So we have like Nexus tablets that uh, run uh, verifiers. Uh, we have, uh, you can use uh, NFC phones. And uh, we even at some point uh, asked a, uh, a point of sale uh, uh, manufacturer to implement IRMA on uh, one of these uh, point of sale uh, terminals. So those are usually used for PIN or Mac Stripe uh, uh, payments. That one is horribly slow, though, because it runs on Java and stuff, but it works. So I told you about the card. This contains the credentials. Now I'm going to tell you about uh, the application. What can, how, how, make, how do we make sure that you can actually use that system uh, as a relying party? So first of all, of course, the most important bit is the, 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 the application that allows you to verify certain attributes. There was already a picture on the, on the previous slide. On the, on, the, on the left, this, this tablet shows you an IRMA verifier. And basically, uh, it has a hard-coded set of uh, attributes that it wants to verify in this case. And then if you present your card, this is an implicit acknowledgement that you want to show, reveal your uh, attributes there. And then it verifies whether those attributes are actually uh, present on the card. There's also a card proxy. Because like I said, the, uh, you want to use this also in online scenarios, but most uh, PCs or devices don't really have a, a smart card reader. So we implemented something that we call the card proxy that allows a arbitrary mobile phone to be used as a card reader for the attributes. 
while signing into a, uh, a website with, a, with your browser on your uh, ordinary uh, PC. In principle, I'm not going to show you here how it works. The idea is basically that your mobile phone scans a QR code on the, on the screen of the, the ordinary PC, and that handles then the authentication with the session that is basically encoded in this QR code. So then the backend can decide, OK, this is OK. Now I can show you the content on the, on the normal channel on the, on the browser. And there's something that we call the card management app. This is an application that the user uh, typically uses for himself to see what credentials are on there on the card, to delete credentials, to maybe change PIN codes. And something very important, uh, we think, is uh, the ability to view uh, the log file. The log file maintains all the actions that have been performed with this card. So this means that the user can see which credentials were verified at which time, which time by which relying party. So this is like a second channel to verify that certain relying parties actually did ask for the stuff that they, they, they claimed they were doing. And you can actually see after the fact that they may be over asked if, if, they, so, uh, if that happens. So this is a second way of verifying and keeping relying parties in check. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to look at the whole system, I already said basically we see card holders and relying parties as users. Um, then there's providers that provide all these kind of services that are essential for the uh, functioning of the, the EMA system. So this is credential issuers, card issuers, and a revocation authority. The scheme authority basically decides uh, who gets into these respective roles and gets certificates to do that. So for instance, a credential issuer uh, needs to have a, a key pair with which he can sign the credentials, and that needs to be stored in a central repository so that the relying parties can later, later use those keys to verify that the credential is in fact authentic. And then there are certain services at the side that you also need to get this, this system running. Like I said, the, so this is, this is the, 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 the basically what we have here. Um, we're currently running a, a pilot with students. Um, we really want to do this in a more, uh, uh, in a larger, uh, slightly less tech uh, savvy uh, audience. So if you have ideas, come, please come, uh, come forward later after the talk. But there are certain limitations still. So one of the things I already mentioned, there's a 1024 bit RSA key used, which is really too low. Um, because of the computational limitations of the card, we cannot do anything with equality proofs. And uh, we cannot do parallel proofs. So typically, normally speaking, in attribute-based credentials, you can basically show one credential, then another. And in the way the proof is constructed, you can be sure that those two proofs actually belong together. This is something that we cannot do. Uh, in order to remedy the, 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 the situation, because otherwise you would maybe, maybe be able to pool credentials and uh, uh, prove, for instance, that you're uh, I could be able, I could, for instance, prove that I'm over 18 and German, if somebody in the, in the room who's German would help me doing that proof. Um, so this is, uh, this is limited by um, uh, constructing a channel between the card and the relying party, ensuring that only authentic cards uh, talk to the relying parties. We are implementing revocation, um, and I already told you there's weak binding of the card to the cardholder. So there are some issues. But let's get back to the original theme of the story. So there we have this Irma, this, this heroine of the story, that's trying to protect our privacy by implementing attribute-based credentials. But uh, the powers that be, the powers that uh, you know, um, were there already before the internet was, uh, existed, uh, at some point figured out how the internet worked and trying to exert their powers also onto the internet. And therefore, they will also exert their powers onto Irma. And you know, there is a, a general discussion that uh, in, in, in the field of, uh, and this depends a bit on the country where you live, um, whether you should have like identity systems in the first place. So why are we building an identity management, identity infrastructure, if there are, are these risks? And what are these risks? Well, one of the, 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 the most important risks is function creep. Because once you show some attributes to some relying parties to some services. If, you, uh, if you're used to showing that you're over 18 at the liquor store, if you're used to showing this and this and this, and if at some point you use your Irma card everywhere and everywhere, it becomes more and more natural to show even more attributes everywhere. And what is stopping these service providers um, asking for whatever they want? Because that's what they're doing now anyway, right? 
to the, and now we're giving them an infrastructure that is giving them authentic attributes. So before, you could maybe uh, you know, lie about your name to uh, you know, evade a real name policy. Maybe you could lie about your address, where you live, if you want to shop abroad. I mean, there's like services like Borderlinks or whatever that allow me to shop in, in, in Germany or in the UK or the US, and they just ship it to me. In, in a way, I'm lying, right? Because it's not my address. Uh, more fundamentally, maybe, is the fact that um, the service provider sets age restrictions. Now, typically, um, service providers are uh, American, and their age res restrictions are ridiculous. So, you know, typically parents in Europe will say, okay, you, uh, to, to their, 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 their children, you can go on Facebook. And, it, and in some cases, the children just go on Facebook and lie about their ages themselves. I mean, they're, they're good. But, you know, this is no longer possible if you have a system like IRMA that would allow Facebook to verify the age of whoever tries to sign in using IRMA. You would not be able to lie about your age anymore. And attributes are cookies, really. If a, a big uh, 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 shop or a big company like DoubleClick would register as a credential issuer and uh, whenever I visit a site that is affiliated to DoubleClick would issue a credential with an attribute that ident is identifying and uh, issues that to my card. And then when I visit an arbitrary other site that is affiliated to DoubleClick that asks for that credential and that attribute to be revealed, I'm tracked all over the place. And again, it's very authentic. I cannot play with this stuff. I cannot even try to taint the database or do anything. It's, you know, that's a problem. And I told you about the Scheme Authority, which has a very important role to play defending against the things that I just talked about. But the problem is that who is that Scheme Authority going to be? This is, this is really a hard problem, because we, uh, uh, we talked, for instance, in, in the Netherlands, they are thinking about implementing an electronic identity card as well, like the, the, the German system, um, and we talked to them, and then at some point we thought, okay, suppose that at some point the Dutch government would decide, which I think would be very, very cool, actually, uh, to allow IRMA to be on this uh, Dutch identity card. Then the question comes up, who is going to be the scheme authority? Is it going to be the government? Is it going to be an independent party? Is it going to be a, a company? Who is that going to be? Because that, that has huge ramifications for the, the potential of abuse of such a system. And especially if you know, attribute-based credentials are used to prevent the uh, government from tracking you all over the place, then maybe letting the government being the scheme authority is not a very good idea. Um, the, the, the underlying theme of, of, uh, attribute of at least the IRMA uh, system is that we want to put the user in, in control, which I think is a, a, a valid uh, uh, point of departure. Uh, however, you have to be very, very careful by not making the user responsible for everything, because the user can screw things up horribly. And you really have to think about these things, and I must admit that this is hard. And, and we, don't, we don't really know yet uh, uh, how we can help the user making the right decisions in all cases. So this is, this is also a problem. Um, finally, also what I mentioned is uh, uh, there is this card management app that allows you to see all the credentials that are on your card. Of course, this card management app is protected by a PIN code. But, you know, if there's some malware on my, my mobile device that I use to verify, you know, do something with this card management app, it's trivial for that malware to intercept my PIN code and then later, you know, access these credentials and do whatever it wants. So this is really a way to pickpocket my, 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 uh, my, uh, my card, my credentials. And there's many, many more. There are many more. Um, there's no auditability, which actually, I mean, this, was the, this, this is the purpose of the system, right? Uh, but in certain use cases, this is a problem for relying parties that want to use that system. Um, okay, I already told you about the card management app, uh, app that implements that API. Um, of course, a very important issue is also the fact that attribute-based credentials, if you 
and, and, and these kind of privacy preserving systems really go against current business models. And the, the underlying question is perhaps that, okay, of course we should build privacy enhancing technologies, but maybe we should also try to counter the business models that you know, go, in, go against this. People want to share, um, and for, for, uh, for uh, 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 say, more government kind of people, they always have this argument that anonymi anonymi anonymity is abused uh, by people that don't want to show what they're doing. So for them, this is a disadvantage. I'm not claiming that that's, for me is a disadvantage, but this is certainly for certain people a disadvantage of these kind of systems. So the qu question is, I've been telling you about this cool project, and I still, still think it's cool, but I'm also telling you about these problems that we see with a system like this. So how can we reconcile good and evil? Can we reconcile good and evil? Should we reconcile? Well, I think in a way, there, we need to. We need to think about how to make identity, man, identity EID systems uh, more privacy friendly because they are out there. They're in Belgium, they're in Estonia, they're in Germany. The German system is, is, is slightly privacy friendly, I should say. They allow you to prove certain uh, attributes about yourself, but they are. It's limited, and the security features are different. A different talk all by itself, actually. If you want to know more, please discuss. Uh, come up. Come up. Um, so, you know, these things happen. And if these things are built, then I'd rather have a system that has the technology that allows you to, uh, to make it more privacy friendly uh, from the start. And not make it totally trackable like a Belgian system or a different Dutch system. But I think the more fundamental point here, and that's the, the, uh, the, the, the message that I also want to send here, is that you know, technology alone doesn't help. It's useless, it's helpless, it's whateverless. Um, it's one thing you do together with um, you know, legal uh, safeguards, together with um, economic principles, business models, whatever, think about these things as well. And in general, think as a society about how you want to use this system, these systems. Because even if you would implement a totally privacy-friendly attribute-based credential system like IRMA and implement it on a, a, a national EID card, if people really want to abuse that system for total surveillance, they will be able to do that. But at least in this kind of way, you make it much harder to do it. And if you would have the proper controls, in terms of a good scheme authority that has independence, if you would have proper legal safeguards, if you would have proper incentives to use these systems in the right way, then we actually would have a world that is much more privacy friendly. And that uh, concludes uh, my talk. Um, thank you for uh, your uh, patience and uh, you, you listening um, this early hour uh, here in Hamburg. Um, if there are any questions, uh, please, please feel free. Um, use the microphones. I'm told. <clears throat> Hi. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Also touching on some of the more challenging aspects. Um, I've heard similar talks about these attribute credentials, uh, focusing specifically on the crypto, uh, which researchers get totally excited about. Um, but as you stated, uh, the real problems are with the incentives and the business models. And so um, I'm curious, like, what's your take on the, the system is out there or the, the technology exists for many years already and hasn't been really been deployed uh, in, in the wild other than in research labs. Um, and the two companies who had been spearheading this effort, IBM and Microsoft, even themselves are not using that technology. In fact, they are doing standardization on completely different technologies. And if you look at the, the marketplace, and you mentioned uh, the practices on, for example, mobile phone applications, illustrate that there's obviously a uh, huge reluctance to just ask for a limited number of uh, data elements, but instead people ask for everything, even, even your uh, most stupid, um, the, the stupidest game uh, does that. And nobody enforces that. So, like, how do we actually get from where we are today to anything that is better, even if it's not, um, like, has all this fancy uh, crypto around it? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, uh, actually, you're asking many different questions in one question, which is a challenge to answer. But thanks anyway. It's it's, it's good. Um, I think your observation about people not using this kind of technology is actually much is not even limited to attribute-based credentials. I think it's limited to ident it, it extends to identity management systems in general. I and mean, we still use username password systems almost everywhere. And this has to do with the fact that in, a, in, in any identity management system, and this includes attribute-based credential systems, the, uh, the ins there is a, a, a two-sided market. You need users that are able to use the system, and you need relying parties that accept that form of identity uh, assurance, so to speak. And the problem is, of course, that if there's no users, no relying party is going to implement that interface. And if there's no relying party implementing that interface, there's not going to be a user wanting to use those systems. So that's, that is in itself a challenge. But I, you have a I, I, I think I disagree with you on that, but um, there are many uh, identity management systems used today in different, in different industries, uh, even on, on for consumer-based web services. Like if you think of OAuth uh, mm -hmm. as one, you, you find that all over the place. Um, yeah. But the challenge has been, and you hinted slightly to that, is uh, the choice of the technology. Um, so you have these smart cards. Obviously, if you want to use smart cards with your regular web browser, you will be you basically cut 95% of your uh, audience away, mm -hmm. which is for many of the internet services uh, obviously an issue, even if sure. they if they kill 3% of the audience. Sure. So, um, how you actually get uh, to this? I have an incre incremental deployment story is, is sort of the challenge. Yeah, sure, and that's why we, why we said, okay, we're going to use uh, NFC, uh, uh, contactless cards. That's why we said we're going to implement uh, stuff on uh, NFC phones and uh, tablets, which at least allows you to use these things on, on tablets, and we even have thought about integration, integrating that stuff with uh, PCs. But yes, this is a challenge. But we're taking it on. What else can I say? But more questions? Okay, I wonder... If you have, a, if you go, to, for example, to a shop with your card, yeah, and how you make sure that that the shopkeeper really only requests the attributes that you want to reveal. So, say the shopkeeper tells you, "Oh, I'm only asking for your age," but how do you, with the card, with only your card, how do you verify that that's what he's really uh, asking for? Yeah, that's the the, the principal way to prevent uh, that kind of stuff from happening is by giving the shopkeeper in this case a certificate that restricts him to only ask for the age. He cannot ask for anything else because the card will just see that he does not have a certificate for that. That's how you basically prevent that. Because otherwise you run into issues with, okay, who's in user interface I, am I using, where I actually see what he's asking and is this actually what he's actually asking to the card because the card doesn't have, have a user interface. Thanks. Yeah, number three, maybe because. Okay. Um, so when a shopkeeper says, "Okay, give me your card," I'll check your age with it, and uh, then you said the shopkeeper's terminal gives the card a certificate that proves that the shopkeeper is authorized by the scheme authority, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's a process that doesn't involve the scheme authority in kind of an online way, right? So there's no, no way to revoke the certificate. So. If someone sh stole the shopkeeper's um, certificate for, let's say, reading out my name or something like that, he could just uh, put it in his own device, walk around with it, and steal people's information until the shopkeeper's certificate's validity date runs out. Does that thing even have a way to validate what the current date is? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. Yes, uh, um, uh, actually, we use a standard trick that also is used in the uh, electronic passports where, uh, of course, a smart card cannot maintain its own time, right? It doesn't know the date. But it does know the last time it saw a trustful reader. And then it records the date of that trustful reader as a best approximation of now. So with that, you know, that is at least increasing, and then at some point, uh, uh, credentials expire. But definitely, that is an issue. This is how we tackle it. You can always uh, add revocation to standard credentials, uh, sorry, sorry, certificates, uh, because these are just basic uh, certificates. You can add that. So that, that's always a possibility to revoke a terminal. Bob. Um, lots of different cards have lots of different vendors. Yeah. And there's lots of mechanisms below the level where you operate. There's the anti-collision stuff. There's serial numbers. There's yeah. different protocol versions. So there's many ways to identify the users of this card long before any of your beautiful software 
has has ways of, of preventing that. True, uh, that, but of course that uh, it, that depends on the kind of cards you use. That depend, depends on the on whether you use a random. Uh, random identifiers instead of fixed identifiers. So you have to be very, very careful. But even then, even our own research at our group shows that even if you put all that kind of stuff, you could even distinguish different kind of silicon by just the way that the hardware performs. So in the end, yes, that 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 does that is a possibility. Uh, but you have to do much more work. That's how are we on time? Or So we still have 10 minutes left. There okay. are questions so a queue, over there. Yeah. Um, number four, maybe? Um, in a physical shop, do, does the shopkeeper use NFC? Or can he? I think he shouldn't. OK, explain why he shouldn't. Well, I could take my card, put it in a microwave, steal your card, and show your card with a picture. And um, I mean, no. well, that's take your card, put it in the microwave, and um, sh show my. No, no, put my card in the microwave and put your card behind it so it can read it out. Yeah. That oh yeah, sure. Oh sure, but that, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, if you, but I mean, if you would, you, if you would steal my card, uh, uh, you could use that. Uh, maybe you would have to laminate it over and put your picture on it, and then that would be possible. But that's depending on the kind of security features that you have on the card, uh, uh, that will be easier or not so easy. Well, I could but that is independent of using NFC, right? I could use my smartphone and just have a high-powered sender so I could have your card somewhere in the vicinity and just put my card right on the device and say, yeah, that's me here, my picture, right? Yeah, this, these are, yeah, of course. I mean, this, this is in, in general with contactless cards, you have relay kind of attacks, which are an issue. Yes. Uh, I have two questions. Two questions. The first one is you said that you use pins to manage the credentials. How to prevent brute forcing of pin codes? Um, yeah, okay. You use long, long pin codes? No, I mean, this is, the, I mean, in general, I mean, the, 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 I guess the, the, the underlying principle, the underlying idea is that you keep your, your, your earmark card to yourself. You're not supposed to give it, if, if you lose it, you should revoke it. And, and in that way, uh, avoid abuse of that. But you know, if once you lose a card, uh, in this case, this is a problem. We have been thinking actually for the card management app um, to to do something slightly more uh, advanced by uh, not only using a pin code to access all the credentials on the card, but for instance, binding the card to one specific user device. So you would have to have at least the corresponding device to actually read the full contents of the card. Okay. That would at least address your concern somewhat. Yeah. And how many credentials can you store on one card? Not so many. Oh. Uh, I think about uh, between 10 or 20. So this is limited. So actually one of the things we also want to think about is, okay, can you somehow do kind of like caching of credentials in, 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 a, in any meaningful way while still being privacy friendly if you store this stuff either on your own PC or on the cloud or somewhere? Because at some point, actually we do believe that, you know, you know, the basic credentials, the basic attributes you want to prove fit in, in like five or six credentials. But as soon as you want to do special applications, fun applications, the number of credentials you could collect is going to be huge. So then you have to think about these issues. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Um, I've got a question about um, whoever the authority is storing all of this data. Um, have you thought about how you can distribute that data among many authorities so that no one authority has every, knows everything. Because if I'm imagining in, if this were to take off in 10 years, 20 years, something like that, you might have all of the information about everybody in the world and you don't want that on, in one big, it becomes a honeypot. Sure, no, and that's, that's, I mean, that's a good question but because actually that is what Irma tries to prevent. Because it actually, exactly. it actually is, uh, uh, the idea is that you store your credentials on your card. So Irma and not doesn't have else. the credentials. Sorry? So Irma doesn't have the credentials. No, no, no. Oh, the Scheme okay. Authority only manages who can, has access to the infrastructure, let's say, but it doesn't store it. Only okay. the card stores it. And this is a big difference from, say, Irma and the more traditional identity management systems that I showed in the beginning. But thanks for the question because Thank then you. it's clear. Yeah. The person in the back three. Yeah. Uh, 
can you do the age verification that I'm older than 18 without revealing my actual age? Yeah. Okay. But the, the, I, yes, yes, the answer is yes, but we use a trick here because uh, one of the things that we, I, I told you, we can only do equality proofs. In, in, in Edemix, uh, the, 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 the crypto library, the full implementation actually allows you to ask an arbitrary question like, okay, is this person over X years? And then based on your date of birth, the system would actually compute a proof whether this is yes or no. In our case, we cannot do that because the card is way too slow for that. So we basically slow, uh, store a bit. And we have predefined uh, age ranges that we store. Uh, and then uh, another question, if... Uh I buy something online from a physical shop. Would it be possible that my name and address uh, get revealed to the mail carrier, but not to the actual uh, shop? No, because I mean the 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 the, the whole s in a in a way, whenever you use the Irma system, a a session, a secure channel is set up between the card, really the card is the endpoint, and the relying party on the other end. Of course, if the relying party at the other end is going to do whatever it wants with those things that he gets, I mean, that, that is something that we cannot stop, except that at some point the scheme authority is going to say, okay, you're, gonna, you're abusing the system, you're out. Yeah? Okay, thank you. Last mm -hmm. question, I guess. I have a question regarding purpose limitation. Yeah. Um, in, in, your, in the scheme or in, in general with, with, uh, with systems today, you basically, the idea was of the uh, data protection regulation that uh, providers themselves or by a through regulation um, get incentives to ask for as little as possible. Um, and you mentioned that as a, a shortcoming or a challenge for your system as well. Mm -hmm. And that is indeed tricky because um, think about angry, angry birds who ask for your location mm -hmm. uh, and obviously don't give you a choice. You can't say, no, I don't want to give my locations. The game is still supposed to work. Yeah. So um, someone would have to look at the purpose of the application and then decide on what would be legitimate and what not. Yeah. Um, apparently that doesn't happen today, so I wonder how you would imagine this to work in the future. Like, who would check uh, regularly, ideally, with every software update, whether the new feature is actually reasonable for that application or it's not? Because obviously application providers themselves would argue, I need the location for location-based advertising, period. Yeah. They, they are in the control, the users are not uh, putting the, con the user in, in the control doesn't help because the user has no voice in that game. True, and that is, that is, that is um, uh, you're, you're sketching the scenario of, uh, for instance, installing an application on a mobile phone or, and, or, anywhere. or, whatever, or anywhere else. Uh, and that, in that case, there is not really a, a third party that sort of protects the individual user against basically the big, the big power of the, the application provider that basically sets the, the rules of the game. And here, in, at least in, Air, in the Irma scheme, the scheme authority has to issue a certificate to the relying party allowing him to access the attributes in the first place. So if he does not get a certificate, he does not get anything. Now, of course, it depends on the, on the, on the spine of, the, of the, the scheme authority whether this is going to make any difference in the real world, yes or no. But at least the, the, the default is that the relying party gets nothing. And this is different from the, 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 the situation now. But it well, it depends on, of course, the application you have today, but uh, um, it, it doesn't seem that there's a story on who would actually do that. I don't think the identity provider will go off and will talk and look at the app every application and then say, okay, now this is, this is useful practice. Like, if I have uh, my identity provider, the uh, fast-moving German government, um, they will then look at all the applications on the Internet and will figure out on whether that's a, a fair use. I don't think that's particularly realistic, and also, like, they don't even have the manpower to do that. Um, that, that, like, is, that is an issue, and that's why I said, and this is the discussion about, okay, who is going to be the scheme authority, and is this going to be trust, is it really going to be trustworthy, and is it really going to do that kind of checks? And I their, totally agree with you. This and is what a, their business model is, because obviously they yeah. would have to have lots of people to sure. actually check out each and every application, whether they do the right thing. Sure. Uh, sure. I agree. Um, okay, okay. Thank you. We, we still have one very short question, I've been assured, from the internet. Ah, okay, from the internet, cool. 
Um, the voice of the internet. Yeah. Um, one question from the IRC was, uh, do you thought about a display on the card? So maybe you can check which uh, information the shopkeeper wants? Yeah, that, that would be cool. And actually, I mean, uh, I think I've even seen pictures from the 70s of Visa having these kind of cards with display. So this is definitely a, a, a possibility, uh, but we haven't uh, experimented with that uh, yet. Okay, thanks. Right. Thank you, Internet, for the question. Um, let me uh, just point you to the, the, the website for more information if you want to see the... the uh, that also lists the, uh, the GitHub uh, link where the, 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 the sources are for all the code. And anybody interested in demos, at 2 o'clock at the Noisy Square, I will be around to give demos. I still have to find where the Noisy Square is. I have no idea yet. Let's see, I will find it. Maybe see you there. Thank you very much.